All right, welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Uh, thank you, Rob, by the way. Rob was just trying to call me, and that's how I knew there was something wrong. Uh, usually when I'm on live, uh, Rob would know that I couldn't answer the phone, but obviously when I looked down, I saw him calling. There must have been something wrong with the broadcast. I apologize, folks. I've been sitting here now for about three minutes talking to you guys, and it was on mute, so I do apologize the audio issue has been fixed, and thank you once again. Uh, unfortunately, <clears throat> this is what happens when I'm uh, producerless. My uh, beloved partner in crime and producer is unfortunately sick, and basically what I had uh, has been passed on to her now, and it laid me out for a few days, folks. So uh, Mari is comfortable resting right now, but uh, we'll say that the flu got a hold of her pretty good, and unfortunately... Um, when I'm all alone, these mistakes will happen. And uh, thank you, Rob, once again for getting me back on track here. Anyway, so our solar winds are sitting at a 430.5 kilometers per second with a density of 19.3. And what I was talking about uh, before Rob called me, uh, there's zero sunspots right now on the sun, which is 153 days. And right here, this article, uh, we talk about the last time you have to find a stretch of uh, spotless days like we're experiencing right now this year is back from 2009. And it's saying so far that this is, you know, if, if 2009 was experiencing its deepest minimum in a century, what are we going through right now? Because we're at not even the peak of our solar minimum. We are just in the beginning stages, 19 and 20 are expected to be the two years that we're expecting spot the most spotless days and possibly longer. Uh, solar cycle 25 is still a charted uh, as unknown. I know a lot of folks um, are on the side of we're in the grand solar minimum right now. Some folks think that we're going to experience another week cycle in 25, which I have seen other charts and evidence that would point to that as well. And then we get to the real spotless days so that's what i think about when i look at articles like this and they talk about knowing that this is possibly just another cycle before we get to the actual grand solar minimum in 2030 and hearing that we're already looking at numbers that take us back to the 2009 minimum and the scary part is is that we're not even at the peak yet and it's comparing data from now to where we were at the bottom and the last minimum um, you know, speaking of Rob earlier today in our chat, uh, you know, it's going to be a cold winter for the Northeast and the Northwest, I believe. And I, I think the Northern Plains and the Midwest and some parts of the South are going to experience uh, colder weather this year, too. I think we're underestimating some of these forecasts. Um, I can tell you that right now. I'm just seeing some of the, the weather patterns that we've had just in the last 30 days, <clears throat> the shift. We started off the month of September very hot, especially here in the Northeast. We, we saw 90 degree weather three days in the first uh, six days of September. Since then, we have leveled off now to averaged to normal temperatures uh, for this area. And across the nation, you know, we're not seeing the record breaking, breaking heat that was being predicted for September into October as well, folks. And they're still talking about... Um, October through December being a warmer than average fall. We'll see. I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. I can already feel the chill in the air, and it's September 24th, right on cue. It's fall. In my opinion, I think fall arrived on time in the region that I live in here in the Northeast, and this is probably the first time that I've ever witnessed fall-like weather actually happening right at the beginning when it's supposed to. Our KP indices are sitting at a 2 with a 24-hour max of 3, Taking a look at the SDO, they're saying we could expect some solar wind increase today and tomorrow. Uh, very unorganized areas of coronal hole. Let's take a look at it in motion. And we're just really um, quiet right now as far as any kind of solar flares or sunspots. Now, there is some areas uh, here in the northeast part of our star. It looked like we might have had some kind of uh, release of some sort, magnetic release. Let me get my, my imagery here. Uh, let's take a look here as the sun resets. Watching this area, folks. 
And other than that, that's about the only thing that we have going on with our star. Now, uh, we are watching this area right here, and also this indicates that we might have a minor coronal hole in this region. But this right area right here, uh, if we have any sunspot activity, expect it to be in that area of, the, of our sun. So we'll keep our eyes on that. And taking a look at our TSI readings for September, what is this? September 16th, 2008, it's at a 1360.736. And if you look here for the past several days since the 10th, the TSI has been almost at a straight and narrow here in the last several days. <clears throat> Let's get on to some headlines here from the watchers. Uh, Bangalore breaks a 30 year old rain record, a rainfall record, I should say. Heavy rains and strong winds hit Bangalore, the capital of India's southern Karnataka state, on September 23rd, flooding roads and uprooting trees. Uh, this area here, the layout recorded the maximum of 8.11 inches of rain in 24 hours, September 24th, followed by another 7.6 inches and 4.92 inches in Kingri. <clears throat> There was no cyclonic system, and the heavy rains were caused by a wind discounting from Tamil Nadu to the south interior of Karnataka, he told the PTI. It broke its record of previously at 6.99 September 12th of 1988, and more heavy rain is expected to continue into the area for the next two days. And just like Stevie Ray Vaughan always sang about, it is flooding down in Texas. Right now, we've seen over 14 inches of rain in 48 hours in Bonham, Texas. It's over four times the amount that September averages. So keep an eye on that area. We are not talking about just flooding on the coast. Here is a little bit of more information about uh, what is going on right now. As you can see, the flooding uh, just as bad here as it is off of the coast. But they are also looking at other areas uh, that included Arlington with 7.42 inches of rain, Carrollton with almost over 6.5, and, and Dallas Lovefield with 6.118 inches of rain in just a 48-hour span. And folks, that's in some cases, that's still double the amount of rain that falls in an area for a month. Uh, Lamont Bain, a National Weather Service meteorologist, said some areas of North Texas may have received even more than bottoms 14 inches in places with no official gauges. Heavy rain over the weekend damaged homes and closed several road roadways, including a temporary shutdown of U.S. Highway 75 on Friday night. As of noon Monday morning, the DFW airport has recorded 11 and a half inches of rain. The previous record for the month of September was 10.8 inches of rain set in 1932. So not just for one day, but the, for the entire month, the record was 10.8. And they just about shattered the record in one day in some areas. Let's keep moving here to, or was this other one? Look at this. More hail in Uruguay. 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 Yeah, Uruguay. Here we go. Let's take a quick look at this. It's not the first time we've seen this extreme weather in this region, Uruguay. Pretty big uh, hail balls there, at least golf ball to baseball size hail. Uh, taking a look at some of these images here as well. Look at that. Those are definitely baseball size. Once again, we are seeing extreme hail in all over the world. It, you know, it started off a couple years ago when we first started talking about this stuff. Uh, a couple years ago, it would be big hail events here. It was spotty all over the world in 16. In 2017, we really saw a, a, an uptick in hail storms. But I have to say this year, 2018, since January, I have seen so many images just like this with hail the size of baseballs or higher. Back windows busted out, holes like Swiss cheese. Uh, you know, this is becoming the new norm. And that's what's freaky. We talk about sunspots that are in a level right now that we're in the last minimum's peak, and we're not even at a peak right now. We haven't even dropped to the bottom where we're supposed to see the least amount of activity. So just something to keep paying attention about. And I know maybe it's repetitive that we keep talking about, you know, the big hail events throughout the world and, and always remind folks that 
these increases are due to uh, you know extra amount of cosmic rays in the atmosphere, more particles for this stuff to form, and you know not just home damage and car damage, but we're talking crop damage too. And there's so many weather events going on right now that's causing crop damage. And the worst part about this crop damage that we're experiencing right now is because of this right here, the harvest moon. We are in prime time for harvesting our crops. And we're seeing more floods and more hail events and snow in places in Canada, like in Alberta, and it's still snowing. We reported last week that they were going to see more snow in the region. That forecast has held true. I saw a comment in one of our videos where an individual uh, still getting snow. He says they're two weeks away from getting into the fields. And he, he is familiar with a 6,000-acre farm that he is associated with. So imagine 1,500 acres you can't get into. This guy's got 6,000 acres that he's trying to get work into right now and can't. Um. So I'm very worrisome about the crop situation in Canada, parts on the coast, and we'll talk more about why uh, there could be another chance for some rain for that area from tropical remnants. And let's see if there's a deadly flash floods hit uh, Mohican, Mexico. At least five people have been killed and nine others are still missing after the major flash floods hit the town of Perebian. In the state of Mohican, officials said Monday, to, uh, September 24th, 2018. Flash floods took place after unusually heavy rain swelled the Cueto River and sent a wall of flood water as high as five feet crashing through streets of the mountains. Wow. Uh, let's see if I can get a little footage in here without getting in trouble with the videos. A lot of the times it's hard to get these videos to play and they're not going to let us play them. Hopefully if you click on this link here, that it will take you to the official source and it looks like it does and here we can watch uh, looks like many types of videos here that's not even related so I do apologize folks I was hoping that we had a direct link so we could watch these videos I'll leave the link in the description for this maybe uh, one of these will work here we go I think last Friday and last show we did, we were showing some areas that were flooding like this too, and not in Mexico. Heavy rain, floods, and landslides leave at least 11 dead in northern India. Torrential rains, flash floods. So we go from Mexico to India. Take a look at some footage here. Water rushing through the streets soaking up cars this is just a common sight almost everywhere around the world right now look at this jeez Let's see what we got in the stats here torrential rains called flash floods uh, landslides in mountainous regions of northern india killing at least 11 people in jammu and kashmir uh, on september 24th the baka beast management board issued an advisory to the Punjab government that it will release excess water from the Pong Dam in the wake of the ins insistent rains. Um, educational institutes have been ordered to remain closed on Tuesday. Schools have also been closed in Dada district of Jammu and Kashmir and in most places in that uh, province. So another area here that we're looking at and also possible tornado in Germany. Where's this other one that I wanted to see? Oh, here we go. So remnants of Medicaid hit Brian, or Medicaid Brian hit Tunisia. And we have an actual separate article on that. Here we go. Saturday storm calls water levels in some areas to rise as much as 5.6 feet as bridges and roads were damaged in record rains that dropped the equivalent of nearly six months average precipitation. In most places, water levels have begun falling quickly, the Interior Ministry said, adding, however, the death toll has risen to, to five after a teenager was electrocuted on sun, Sunday, unfortunately. Um, given stats of people who have passed away, trying to cross roads, you can't do that. And floods like this, you, you don't walk in waters. The, the current will sweep you away. Again, very familiar from the other two videos that I just showed you, Mexico and India. 
and now here in France. It said it's been raining since noon in the afternoon, and then it became torrential. Uh, just minutes, the water swept the fence away, the boiler room, the summer kitchen, and part of the house. And he said, I was scared for my life. Storm dumped to 7.9 inches of rain on Nabil and up to 225 millimeters in the city of Benay. It was the heaviest rainfall since the Institute began keeping records in 1995. So impressive. I'm sure we can go back into more uh, scientific research and find other times where it's rained like this. But still, just another notch in the belt of Mother Nature right now flooding us out. And not trying to be um, gloom and doom, but we stay on the same topic of flooding because now we're looking at Super Typhoon Trami, now a monster Cat 5 with 160 mile an hour sustained winds. As expected, Super Typhoon Trami has ex intensified into a Category 5 typhoon overnight and is now a powerful storm with over 160 miles an hour sustained. Gust up to 196. So this is like Mancock. Central pressure is around 916 millibars. It's pretty low. It is expected to maintain its strength in the next three days and could eventually even strengthen a bit. Could reach near 180 sustained winds, folks. Where is this thing going? An area that does not need any more hurricanes uh, this is a little bit further north but we're still talking um, some areas that are in the path of this storm again this is the third well the second super typhoon in this region but the third biggest the bigger of uh, the bigger storms have hit in this region and it all started south moving its way to the middle and now up northern parts of Asia Authorities in Georgetown County, South Carolina, are urging thousands of people to evacuate ahead of historic flooding in an area where multiple swollen rivers converge. The county escaped the brunt of Hurricane Florence's wind, but it sits at the mouths of the Waccamaw, Great Petey, and Sampit Rivers. Uh, parts of Georgetown County will see at least 10 feet of flooding, forecasters say. Keywords, at least. The flooding is expected to begin Tuesday and will last through the weekend. The PD River is the elephant in the room, he says. The Great PD and the larger Waccamaw River have already swollen record levels upstream, as demonstrated by flooding 40 miles north and in around Conway, where the Waccamaw is still rising and that water is now traveling downstream at historic levels. There is no benchmark for comparison, not even the destruction wrought by Hurricane Matthew last year. Making matters worse is the potential for tides to exaggerate wa flood water levels normally from low tide to high tide. Georgetown sees about three foot difference in the water level where the Great Petey River meets with the Wainau Bay. Monday night's full moon means high tides will be even higher if the rivers hit peak crest during high tide. Flooding will spread even farther into the city. This is just bad luck. Uh... The fact that we are in a giant full moon right now, the harvest moon for the next three days, and these waters and high tide combine, they're seeing at least 10 feet in certain areas, if not worse. So uh, what's frustrating about this um, as well is now we've got some nonsense of um, some fake news, like always. And... I kind of wanted to, once I got done with um, the headlines, there's a couple stories that I've seen today. And this one right here, another one of those um, damn it moments when you see uh, stories like this, flood damage, Florence flood damage thousands more homes because of sea level rise, study shows. Uh, this is just a big gob of lies. I read over this. I'll leave the... Um, link in the description um, this article states that we've had and, and here's the thing it just keeps saying that the sea level has risen since this 1970 it, it really doesn't talk too much about how much each year how much each decade or what their readings are from or 
or anything like that. There's no actual data on that except here at the bottom where it talks about data on tides for the Carolinas show an average rise in sea levels about six inches since 1970. Are they talking about when high tide comes in that there's a rise? Are, because that's the only information they give about sea level rise is when the data on tides for the Carolinas show a rise in sea level about six inches since 1970. Um, I'm not sure where they're going with this. There's no facts and there's nothing really backing this up. Just a bunch of stats about how many homes have been damaged and spared and this and that. Uh, not downplaying that we're not experiencing a lot more um, damage on the coast from flooding. But these guys here are telling you that it's sea level rise. And look, they're showing these pictures right after a storm. Okay. This is not your average day footage. This is right after in the beginning of the swell from Florence. So they're trying to make this more drama as if, you know, you're looking at um, floodwaters or just rate these, these are the regular waters. This is normal. It's not normal. But then I found another article that was out in 09. And of course, this, this fella here states that uh, rise of sea levels is the greatest lie ever told. I'm going to read a little bit from this. Uh, if one thing more than any other is used to justify proposals that the world must spend tens of trillions of dollars on combating global warming, it is the belief that we face a disastrous rise in sea levels. The Antarctic and Greenland ice caps will melt, we are told. Warming oceans will expand, and the result will be a catastrophe. Although the UN's IPCC only predicts a sea level rise of 17 inches by 2100, Al Gore in his Oscar-winning film, An Inconvenient Truth, went much further, talking of 20 feet, which when, <laughs> when you hear that, you know, the six inches seems like a lot. This guy's, this is how you know that Al Gore doesn't understand anything about our planet, climate-wise, period, to make such an exaggeration of sea level rise. Uh, goes on to fear porn about how showing computer graphics of cities such as Shanghai and San Francisco half underwater. Yeah, we've all seen 2012. We all know the graphics showing central London in a similar reply. As for a tiny island nations such as the Maldives and Prince Charles like to tell us that the Archbishop of Canterbury was again parroting last week. They are due to vanish. Uh, but there is one scientist who knows more about sea levels than anyone else in the world is Swedish geologist and physicist Niles Axel uh, Morner, formerly chairman of the International Commission on Sea Level Change. I'm, I'm going to listen to this guy here. Okay, He was the chairman of the International Commission on Sea Level Change. It says here, and the um, uncompromising verdict of Dr. Morner, who for 35 years has been using every known scientific method to study sea levels all over the globe, is that all this talk about sea level rise is nothing but a colossal scare story. Huh. Despite fluctuations as down as well as up, the sea is not rising, he says. It hasn't risen in 50 years. If there is any rise this century, it will not be more than four inches. And uncertainty plus or minus 10 centimeters. Uh, and quite apart from examining hard evidence, he says, the elementary laws of Felix, physics, Felix, <laughs> physics, latent heat needed to melt ice, tells us the apocalypse conjured up by Al Gore and company could not possibly come about. And that's my point that I just, you know, said here a minute ago. When you hear Al Gore talk about the level of rise in the sea as 20 feet. And this guy is saying that we're going to see in a century no more than four inches. Who's telling the truth? You know, in the article that I showed you here just a minute ago from the whatever this is, the Sacramento or Sacrabee, I don't know what this is, the Sacramento something, Sacramento B wants to tell you that since 1950 or 1970 that our oceans have rose six inches. What I suspect is that this article here has cherry-picked data and used a graph that only goes up to a certain year 
and then that year indicates that there was growth and they just multiplied it by a few other things and said there you go six inches since 1970 which is what almost 50 years but this guy back in 2009 was telling us that we haven't seen our sea levels rise in 50 years he said that there was fluctuations of ups and downs but nothing that said for sure sea level rise so before anybody gets all worried about sea level rise and remember we talked about this earlier in the year where when the trump administration was changing the language on global climate and the 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 actual white house website about you know global warming and climate change and how the new agenda for the army corps and the military this year was no longer listen to this now they have stopped worrying about sea level rise on the coasts the east coast especially and they have now shifted their priorities elsewhere they realized that there was no rise that's why they stopped it has nothing to do with Trump being an evil man this has everything to do with people who can actually understand science and understand what the data means and I'm not saying he does as in the president but I'm saying he has people around him who do know and have told him say hey look yeah we've seen ups and downs but is it a reason for us to prepare for sea level rise no not at all we could be using our time and our money for studies elsewhere and also I'm gonna listen to guys who have been doing this for 35 years as of 2009 and when he writes a study and says that we've had ups and downs but nothing and the most that we would see in a century is four inches so we still have lies from Gore back in 09 when he said 20 feet rise and then this Sacramento Bee uh, garbage rag of newspaper here wants to say that we've uh, risen six inches since 1970 when in fact we haven't I'll leave the uh, link in the description you guys can check out both articles here and I got a little bit through this um, not a lot but it's, I'll read a little bit. This is new insights into the role of water vapor may help researchers predict how the planet will respond to warming. Just as an oven gives off more heat to the surrounding kitchen as its internal temperature rises, the earth sheds more heat into space as the surface warms up. Now, since the 1950s, scientists have observed a surprisingly straightforward linear relationship between earth's surface temperature and its outgoing heat. It goes on to say that the earth is an incredibly messy system with many complicated interacting parts that can affect this process. Scientists have thus found it difficult to explain why this relationship between surface temperature and outgoing heat is so simple and linear. Finding an explanation could help the climate scientists model the effects of climate change. Now it says here, the scientists from MIT's Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences have found the answer along with prediction for when this linear relationship will break down. They observed that Earth emits heat to space from the planet's surface as well as from the atmosphere. As both heat up, uh, say by addition of carbon dioxide, the air holds more water vapor, which that's false, which in turn acts to trap more heat in the atmosphere. This strengthening of Earth's greenhouse effect is known as water vapor feedback. Crucially, the team found that the water vapor feedback is just sufficient to cancel out the rate at which the, the warmer atmosphere emits more heat into space. The overall change in Earth's emitted heat thus only depends on surface. In turn, the emission of heat from Earth's surface to space is a simple function of temperature leading to the observed linear relationship. The findings, which appear today in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, may also help explain how extreme hothouse climates and Earth's ancient past unfolded. The paper's co-authors are EAPS postdoc Daniel Cole and Tim Cronin, the Keir McGee Career Development Assistant Professor in, in, the, uh, in the EAPS. And I'll leave the uh, link here in the description. There's more to read on this story, but I just thought this was something interesting. Uh, very good read, and I advise everyone to take a quick look at this as well. Staying with what's up with that, and this one caught my eye a little bit. 
IPCC to release October surprise on climate change. Now, they have planned a, um, a conference. And I like how Anthony puts the actual definition for October surprise. Any political event orchestrated in the month before an election in hopes of affecting the outcome. Even the much vaunted October surprise might fail to move the race in one direction or the other. And that's what's happening right here. So what they want to do, they want to hold this little meeting. Given the timing, that you can be sure whatever is in the report will be front page news and used by the left as a political tool. Here's a press release from the IPCC to Dr. Willie Soon, which we're not done with him yet. I want to share something with him as well. Um, the IPCC will meet in Incheon, Republic of Korea on October 1st through the 5th to consider the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Subject to approval, the summary for policymakers will be released on Monday, October 8th with a live stream press conference. But guys, th th these people are shady, okay? The press conference addressed by the IPCC chair and co-chairs from the three IPCC working groups will be open to registered media to take place at 10 local time and um, on Sunday, October 7th. And here's where it gets shady. Registered media will also be able to access summary of policymakers and press release undergo embargo once they are available. They will also be able to attend the opening session of the meeting 10 to 11 on Monday, October 1st. But the rest of it between then and the 7th is closed to the public and to the media. Now, Two things, three things really. Well, just two, I guess. This is not transparent. This is the stuff that people like Pruitt of the EPA who has stepped down. And now um, the person who is taking over for him, I can't recall his name real fast, but these people are trying to change things like this. They want transparency. There's no reason why these sessions from October 2nd through the 6th should be closed to the public and the media, maybe just the public, and let the media do the reporting. But then again, you wouldn't get the truth because there's so much fake newsmakers out there. So that's issue number one, transparency. What a coincidence and what, what such luck for the IPCC and the desperate left who wants to win these midterms. Now... There's a lot of reason for us to vote Republican this year, folks, unfortunately, and even if you don't like it. Uh, if you allow to the Democrats to gain seats in the Senate and, and the Congress, and these people will then begin to unravel these EPA regulations, everything that we're trying to work for right now to help save money for me and you by getting rid of this green policy that Barack Obama came up with that has done nothing but skyrocketed energy prices. And we're getting close to that time, folks, where it's going to be deciding whether or not we can keep our thermostat set on 69 on a 13-degree day or by dinner that night. Choice is yours. And the continuance of this green technology and improper information on taxing of it is, is causing that. So here we have... The October surprise, this little special meeting that's going to tell everyone in the world that we are at now 1.5 degrees Celsius on our warming. But we all know that's not true. And, you know, you're like, well, you know, how do we know to trust this information? How do we know? I haven't found anything from Dr. Roy Spencer that steered us in the wrong direction. So let me just show you what the IPCC is telling you that we're up here somewhere. Somewhere up here. Out of the chart. See, my circle goes away. That's where we are. But in reality, real work done by real people who understand climate and how it works is showing us that we're only a, a 0.19 above 
baseline average temperatures right now for the globe. 0.19, folks. Even at our warmest period in 98, 99, in 2016, our recent spike in atmospheric, or I'm sorry, uh, global lower atmosphere temperatures based on the UAH satellite based uh, information was a 0.88 in February of 2016. We are almost a full degree Celsius from that point. And I keep talking about how this is the beginning. And when you hear things like this, where they're talking about our solar minimums, you have to go back to the 09 peak area where we were bottoming out there at two, the 268 and 260 days of sunspots. Um, there's some people that think we might see over 230 spotless days just for this year. I've heard rumors that 19 and 20, it is possible. And some think that this is really possible that we won't see a sunspot for more than 300 days plus in 2019, possibly longer. Lower solar activity, less sunspots, colder temperatures for our planet, which we are seeing right now. So why are we talking about global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius over baseline average? And the no and NOAA released it like a month ago. They're, they're the problem. I just don't get it. I can't understand why we just can't stick to one set of information and interpret it the correct way instead of fudging things to make it worse than what it really is. And I think I've displayed that a couple different times in some of our articles tonight where we're grossly exaggerating the truth. So yeah, they want to talk about this global warming problem. And here's where the third thing that bothers me the most about this October surprise. Right now, the left, one of their bigger attack um, techniques is attacking the Trump administration on lack of knowledge of climate change. Um, he is being called a climate denier, and he is being also accused of someone who doesn't care about the climate and is too stupid to understand that we are going to have a catastrophe on our hands if we don't do something to battle global warming. And that's the scary part, is that there's people out there that are actually going to vote for that purpose to help get the climate back on track. And hey, when you see the IPCC, again, it's all about consensus. The majority of Americans out there would rather just go with the flow instead of critically think for themselves. And do their own research instead of listening to everybody. Example, today at work, we were talking about smartphones. And this guy said the iPhone sucked. I said, that's interesting. I said, what is it about the iPhone that you don't like? And it was some mundane detail that he just wasn't aware of how to do something with the phone. So I told him how to do it. And then he tried to um, name something else. And again, it was something that a friend had told him. I said, where did you hear this from? Oh, some Verizon salesman told me that. And, you know, of course, he was trying to sell the guy probably a Galaxy Note 9, which is a little bit more expensive. But my point is, is that this guy would rather be fed warmed up shit than do his own thinking. Because after I like overcame his objections. He looked at me, he goes, you know what? I don't know why I don't like Apple. I really don't. And laughed about it. But it's the same thing with the consensus. When you look up Google and global warming and climate change, you see so many returns that favor what Al Gore's saying. So people are just like, well, that's it. It's all done. Look at Google. It says it right here. Everybody agrees. But yet, People don't realize how badly we're being censored in the media, in the news, in Google, all of it. They're doing their damnedest to suppress this information. Because it goes against narratives like this right here, like this little October surprise that's going to happen 30 days before an election. And they want to scare their voters Look, Donald Trump is leading us on a, a pathway to disaster. Look at Florence. It's all because of his 
easing of the coal regulations. They're going to they're going to lay it on thick. They're going to scare people and lie to them about the climate. And they're going to use that. It's about your children's future. Trump's going to kill them if you keep, you know, letting the Republicans do what they do and blah, blah, blah. And couldn't be anything further from the truth. The sad truth about climate change is that nothing we do will start it or stop it. It's going to happen. Is a natural cycle. CO2 and methane gas does not trap in heat. From what I've read recently, I'm, atmospheric pressure makes total sense to me. That's what's trapping heat. Atmospheric pressure. Not CO2. Not methane gas. The Bill Nye experiment was fake. It was fake. Him putting CO2 in a jar and shining a light and trying to demonstrate that the temperature was going up because of the light and the CO2. Bullshit. Taking a look here. This was interesting. Um, Evidence the sun may have turned blue during the 19 or the 1450s through the 60s. Now it turned blue. They thought, and this is a lecture by Dr. Willie Soon, which everyone knows he worked very closely with John Casey, suggests that something odd was occurring with the view of the sun in the decades around 1450 through 1460, which he dubs the global blue sun due to historical anecdotal evidence that has been recorded. The suggestion is that there was a massive volcano eruption somewhere on Earth that put the haze and ash into the air, turning the view of the sun blue. And this is a 59-minute video. Uh, Thanks to What's Up With That for locating this piece. Uh, I suggest that everyone take a look at this. Uh, Dr. Willie Soon, like I said, has worked closely with John Casey. So this man knows a thing or two about earthquakes and volcano eruptions. All right, let's take a look at our current GFS maps and what we're looking at weather-wise. And the Northeast has been kind of consistently getting back to their wet pattern as usual. Uh, We got rain moving through the area through Tuesday. And then in the south, once again, New Mexico, Texas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, northern Texas has already had enough rain. You guys look like to get your fair share again through the rest of this week, starting on Wednesday, moving out into the future. A deep high pressure system moves in through Canada into the northeast. Temperatures trying to gain some kind of strength, but early next week we see another low pressure system bring tons of moisture through the Midwest, the Northern Plains, through the Ohio Valley, into the South for days. And this is a strong front, folks. Look how low that high is getting here. But this is the time of the year where we are going to start seeing cooler temps. And this cold front into October 1st, the Northeast will definitely be inundated with a lot uh, cooler air. Let me get this frozen for sip. There we go. This is what I wanted to look at, the snow chances. And Canada, thankfully, looks like we are out of the woods for moisture for Canada as late as September 21st. And in the region of Alberta and B.C., it goes to lighter rain showers and lighter snowfall. But still, in B.C., we're looking at snow showers. And as we move across the month of September into early October, uh, we see that cooler air flirting closer and closer to some parts of the U.S. with chances of snow in Wisconsin on October 1st. We're going to keep our eyes on this, but at this point, it does look like the northern tips of Wisconsin could see some snowfall activity, and definitely Maine and parts of the northeast will also see chances for snow It even looks like here in the Anirondacks, we have a chance of some mixed precipitation as early as October 2nd. And this is where the GFS will stop us. Now, I was talking about a potential storm in the Gulf that could be here by the 10th, making land shore. Um, This storm gets its act together around the 29th into the 30th. And it's a very slow but a very big moving storm. And right now the track has got it towards Guatemala and Mexico. So there is a chance that we can see that track continue to make that uh, movement. And maybe it might miss the coast. But something that's very far away 
Uh, we're still over 10, 15 days away from this. So we'll keep our eyes on that. But other than that, guys, yeah, there's reports of a zombie-like version of Florence heading towards North Carolina once again. And let's see if we can pick that up here on the GFS. The GFS is really not showing that return right now, just the Euro models. Um, some tropical waves, some, some storms are going to try to form. But we're really seeing temperatures uh, in, the, in our oceans still below where they need to be for, to, to support any kind of strong storm formation. This is all we got going on right now. We got a tropical storm, Le uh, Leslie, that it's just kind of sitting here where Helene was sitting. So hopefully this one doesn't go towards Ireland and the Western UK. And then we've got this disturbance here that's got a chance, a 50% chance of cyclone, cyclone formation in the next five days. And Cape Hatteras and North Carolina, this is not the area that we need to see any more uh, storm surge or wave action as we are still flooding very dramatically in North Carolina and South Carolina. And then we have this uh, storm right here heading towards the Caribbean islands and also uh, Puerto Rico and into the Gulf possibly. But right now it's just a 50% chance. This is uh, the remnants, by the way, of tropical storm Kirk, so these storms are they're born and they're and they're shortly going away afterwards. A lot of the reason the here's the look at the East Tropical Atlantic SST. The anomaly has been up and down. Uh, here lately, we've seen some significant gains, almost near baseline average temperatures once again. But then you get here to the North Atlantic, where we were above baseline very briefly, and now we're almost um, down a full degree. Celsius below baseline as we head through September into October and El Nino has made a little bit of uh, bounce back here We saw it dip below baseline a few days ago. We are now looking at a value of 0.157, but You know some say that we will need to be at 0.25 for El Nino uh, You'll see other areas that will say 0.5 above baseline is where we need to be for El Nino however, whatever which one is the accurate number we're still at best right now looking at a Modaki uh, El Nino type situation. If one at all, we might just remain neutral all the way, folks. Taking a look at our current radar right now. We have rain in Alabama heading through the Tennessee Valley, Manchester, Tennessee, Winchester, Deckard, Estill Springs. You guys will see some showers overnight uh, crossing into the Kentucky border and into northeast Ohio and western Pennsylvania. Now, some of that rain is going to be moving into the New York area by tomorrow morning. Uh, nothing other than that that is too major on our radar up here in Minnesota, parts of Ontario. They've seen their share of weather uh, experiencing heavy moisture right now. And like I said, nothing really heading uh, going on into the, uh, into the coast anywhere. We've seen a lot of lightning strikes here from this area of possible formation. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, right here. That's lightning strikes, current here on windy.com. So other than that, the only action we seem to have is the heavy rain in the South, Tennessee and Alabama, into Georgia, and of course, parts of South Carolina experiencing some showers, as well as North Carolina, and thankfully those are light rain showers right now. Uh, looking at Mike's weather page for the hurricanes, and guys, it's just fizzled out. Uh, we were popping earlier, and there is really really nothing to talk about right now. They're keeping an eye on a few storms. Here's the Kirk model. As you can see in the radar, it's not very organized. It's got low winds, sustained winds near 30 miles per hour. Uh, nothing impressive to speak of as far as that goes. Tropical Depression, lastly, is not even um, organized enough to become a hurricane, they don't think. And look at the projection of its hurricane look at the models just hooking around in the middle of the Atlantic uh, that could be a good thing and it might just fizzle out on its own due to the um, lack of warm temperatures in that region other than that guys we're looking at some flood watches right now uh, in the Kentucky and uh, Ohio Valley Southwest Ohio Cincinnati Chillicothe Portsmouth into West Virginia as well most of Kentucky is under flood warnings or flood watches and it looks like that we are looking up here in parts of Wyoming. Red flag warning, so fire warnings, guys. 
you got a freeze watch and then you got fire warning so we've had dry warmer weather but now we're starting to see cooler weather work its way in the freeze warning pretty early in the year to get a freeze warning that's for sure dew points in 34 degrees uh, Fahrenheit they're looking right now at 54 degrees uh, tomorrow night Tuesday night also a chance for a freeze warning with temperatures as low as 27 degrees and this is in East Natrona Wyoming low of 35 on Wednesday night 34 on Thursday night and Friday things stay around 34 so really a chance for frost or a freeze at least two nights this week tonight and Tuesday night so the next two nights we'll have to keep our eyes on that as well get your plants inside folks and other than that guys um, you know I think I've got pretty much everything that I wanted to cover tonight as I said uh, forgive us tonight we didn't have Mari in the chat she's been under the weather as well as I have which is why we weren't on the air over the weekend so we plan to go back on tomorrow night around the same time for Tuesday uh, until then guys I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening to our broadcast please like and share and we will talk soon people take care <laughs>